So my message today is who gets the last word? And we're going to be reading out of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So the theme verse is starting at verse 4, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. Our theme verse is, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So Paul here is writing a second letter to the Corinthian church. I don't know if you guys know, but Paul was the founder of the Corinthian church. Uh, Paul had been on this missionary trip where he would go from city to city, giving out Jesus Christ to the people. And Paul was the one who had founded these people. He was the one who originally brought Jesus Christ to them. And people had gotten saved. And then he had formed leadership there. He had stayed with them enough time that he had formed leaders, and then his calling was to go on and move on to another city and continue to do his work. So he did that. He left the Corinthian church there in Corinth with leaders, with elders, and who he, he felt he had spent enough time trying to establish their Christian walk. And then later he'd come again and visit. But when, once he left, he didn't just forget them. See, he had a heart for them. He loved them, and in his absence, he would write them. He would write them these letters. So what we call 1 Corinthians, the book of 1 Corinthians or the book of 2 Corinthians, they're really love letters. They're really letters of concern where Paul would continue to just feed the sheep and nurture the sheep, the sheep and lead them. And so he, write, he wrote them in 1 Corinthians, um, and then here again he writes them in 2 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, we know that he had to rebuke them for all sorts of things. Like, you know, whenever you're dealing with people, whenever you're dealing with sheep, there's always things you're going to have to correct them. And, and there, the, the spectrum of things that he had to correct went from, on one hand, they were like, they went from not being believers to being believers and being so gracious that they were even allowing sin to be in the, in the church, and he had to correct that. And then he corrected the division that was happening within the church because what happened that was that when people were getting saved, they were starting to divide. They were saying, well, you know what? I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Paul, and I'm of Jesus. And it was almost like they were gangs within the church, right? Like, they all became these really, really clicky. And Paul had to address that, and he corrected them, and he told them, listen, none of us are anything. He said, in fact, he says in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, um, he says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So he tells them, listen, none of us are anything. Like, we all just come here, we all play our part, but it's God who does the work. And so he was constantly correcting them. You know, the, the Corinthian church, they always, they struggled even in their Christianity to, you know, walk and, and do the right thing. And they even sometimes allowed their spiritual gifts, the things that God had given them and equipped them to minister to one another, they had actually started using it to puff themselves up. And, well, you know what, well, I'm a teacher. Well, I, I, I speak in tongues and I do this. And so he had to correct them for that too. So in love, Paul was constantly writing these letters, constantly loving them. So whether he was there with them or whether he was away from them, he was always thinking about them. Another thing that he did was that when he wasn't there, he sent Titus. Titus was um, a young guy who, who Paul had trained up in the faith himself. And so he sends Titus and he says, you know what, Titus, I'm getting ready to go to Corinth. I want you to go ahead of me and I want you to, you know, go tell me what's happening. You know, let me know what's going down over there. So Titus comes back to Paul and he informs him about all the things that he saw and all the things that were going on in the city of Corinth in this church. And so when we get to 2 Corinthians this is a letter now where Paul is addressing the good and the bad that Titus reported to him. And so it's got a whole bunch of different things. Usually when I teach, I like to read the entire book to find out what's going on before 
the passage that I'm going to teach, and there was a lot going on, you know. Um, I myself have a brother who's in prison. He's in Texas, and I just wrote him yesterday. And because I was responding to something that he had written to me, my letters covered all kinds of stuff. Like, I was writing to him about my mom. I was writing to him about my daughter. I was just, like, bouncing all over the place. And so 2 Corinthians is kind of like that. He covers a lot of things, but towards the end of this letter, he, we get to this part in 2 Corinthians 10.1, and this is what he says. He says, now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and the gentleness, gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent and bold towards you. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with, the, with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. So here in verse 1, Paul addresses the accusations that some people were saying about him. So he, he says in verse 1, and you can almost see him putting quotes because he says, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent and bold towards you. So this isn't something that he was saying about himself. This is something that they were saying about him. Um, he, they were pretty much accusing Paul of saying, look, you're all big and bad when you write your letters, but when you show up, you're nothing. And that's kind of what they were saying. And I know as a mom, I can kind of relate this. How many of you guys are at work and you send a text message to your kids and you tell your kid, you know what, I'm coming home and things better be the way that I told you they needed to be, right? <laughs> my kids have kind of one up on me because I downloaded this app on my phone that's called Life360 and it tracks me. And my family has this app because I used to run outdoors and my husband had a hard time because I would run at night, and he would say, well, you know, somebody's going to kill you one day. So I said, well, you know what? I'll put a tracking device so you can find me if they do kill me someday. So my whole family has this app where they track me, so the kids actually can tell when I'm around the corner. They're like, oh, the, the, the app goes off, and mom's coming. But I still sometimes send them that letter saying, listen, I'm going to be home, and I intend to be bold if things are not the way that they need to be, right? Now imagine one of my kids tells the other one, you know what, mom always talks trash in her text messages, but when she gets here, she never does anything. She never punishes us, she just yells a lot or talks a lot, but she doesn't do anything, right? Then I would be like, oh, really? <laughs> oh, really, you know, I don't do anything. Then I would be like, okay, well, you know what? I intend to be bold. I intend to enforce what I said. I, and this is what Paul was saying. Paul was saying, listen, this is what the word of God is telling you to do. This is how you should be living. Now, there's some of you who say that in my letters I'm strong, but when I get there, I'm, I don't do anything. I don't rebuke. I don't correct. Well, you know what? Well, I intend to be bold. So he says, please shape up, do what you need to do because I don't want to have to be bold with the boldness that I intend to be. So Paul intended to boldly confront those who were accusing him and Titus of walking according to the flesh. So there was this accusation that these guys were actually coming and that they were in it for selfish reasons. That Paul and Titus were not there because they loved the people, but they were there actually, they were there for their own reputation and they were there for the money. Because one thing that Paul would do was that when Paul would travel from city to city, he would take money from the wealthier churches, he would ask them and they would give, and then he would take it to the churches where Christians were less fortunate and where they had less. And so there was this accusation that maybe Paul was in it for the money. But how exactly is Paul going to confront these people? How is he going to confront his critics? Um, well, in pa uh, Paul describes these people in, in 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen 13 in this way. He says, for some of them are false prophets, I'm sorry, false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transform transforms himself into an angel of light. So... Paul is saying, listen, I'm going to have to confront some people. I'm going to have to speak boldly to some people. And he says, these people, some of them who are criticizing my ministry, 
They pretend to be Christians. They pretend to be apostles. But you know what? They're, they're, they're nothing more than what the enemy is, somebody who pretends to be an angel of light. And I know that in your life and in your ministries, you come across this where you're trying to do a work for the Lord, and people oppose you, people criticize you. You know, they're not willing to do anything themselves for the Lord, but they're all ready to criticize how you're doing something for the Lord. And how do we deal with, the, with these things? How do we deal with opposition in our lives? Well, is he going to stoop down to their level? No. Is he going to trash talk them? No. Is he going to go on Facebook and blast them? No. That's not how he's going to do it. In fact, 2 Corinthians 10.3 says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So Paul tells him, I am going to go over there. I am going to be bold. But listen, even though I'm in the flesh, in other words, even though I'm human, even though I live in this body, I will not fight as humans do. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. In fact, James chapter 1, verse 19 through 20 tells us this. So then, my beloved brethren... Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. And this is the key. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Do you realize that when you take matters into your, into your own hands, when you get carnal, when you get in the flesh, when you try to fight your own battles, when you try to back yourself up, you're never going to see the righteousness of God in that situation. We need to make sure that we are fighting the right way and that we're fighting a spiritual war with spiritual weapons. So God's righteousness cannot be seen in us when you and I decide to fight it out in our flesh. As we continue to read in 2 Corinthians 10.4, this is what he says. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds for casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So Paul understood that he was in a war and he knew who the real enemy was, which is extremely important because listen, if you don't even know that you are in a war, then you're an easy prey. If you don't know that you're in a war, then you're not going to have your game face on. You're not going to be ready to go to battle. You know, the fact that I know that I'm constantly in a spiritual war, no matter what the enemy throws at me, I have my game face on. I'm ready. I'm like, oh, I see this. I know this. Before I'm going to teach how to retreat, my life goes crazy. Before I'm going to teach at a conference, all this doubt starts coming into my mind and into my heart. Before I'm going to do something for the Lord, something always goes wrong. But because I know that I'm in a spiritual war, I know who the real enemy is. It's not my kid who's acting a fool. It's not my husband who suddenly becomes really needy. It's none of those people. <laughs> There is an enemy behind it. There is a, there's a war behind it. And if you don't know that you're in a war, then you're easy prey. So the first thing that Paul acknowledges is that he is in a war. There is a real spiritual fight going on. If you don't understand, again, what kind of war you are in and what kind of enemy you are fighting, you are going to be using the wrong types of weapon. And you know, I, I find that when we're using the wrong weapons and when we're fighting the wrong war, we get exhausted. We get so tired because no matter what we do or what we say, things just don't change. People don't change. The situation doesn't change. And a lot of times it's because we're fighting the wrong war. We're fighting a war on the wrong level. So it's important that we understand, like Paul, that the battle that you and I face every single day, those battles are spiritual, and that we need to fight back using spiritual weapons that are mighty in God. Paul says our weapons are mighty in God, and we choose to use the flesh instead. So do you realize that there is a spiritual battle and a spiritual side to everything that you and I go through, that the real battle is not the person who's irritating you right now, that it's not the person who's not behaving the way you want them to right now, that it's not the person who's criticizing you right now. No, the battle is against the spiritual forces that are motivating those people to behave the way that they are behaving. 
you know, I have a son who's 23 years old, and I have to say, by far, he's definitely like my daredevil. He's that middle child. He's like, if anybody's going to do something crazy and stupid, it's going to be him, right? And he, he has gone through so many different battles. When he was 18, um, he got kicked out of school. And then he kind of came back to the Lord, and we thought, okay, we're in the clear. You know, he kind of got whatever he needed to get out of his system. And he went off to go to a Christian university, you know, with a scholarship and everything. And we're, like, really happy. We're like, oh, praise God, this is behind us. And then only come to find out that he was really living a double life. That although he was going to a Christian university and he was, you know, functioning in school and he worked, he had a job and he looked really good on the outside, there was this whole other side to him. He was sneaking out at night, he, was, he had began to smoke cigarettes, started vaping, and eventually was doing drugs. And he was doing all this crazy stuff. And it got to the point where we had to give him an ultimatum and we had to ask him, you're either going to repent and stay or you're going to take that stuff and you're going to leave because there's, you just can't live here in harmony with us. And my son chose to keep his stuff and leave. And he left and he was homeless for a couple of months. All he had was his car. He lost his scholarship, lost his job. And like I said, was eventually just homeless in his car. And then one day he, came, he called me asking for money. And I said, no, I can't, I'm not giving you, I can't give you any money. And he said, mom, I have nothing. And I said, yeah, I know. And he, I told him, this is where you need to look up and figure out how did you get there. And he came back and was repented, was walking strong with the Lord, and every now and then, he gets these like urges to go back to doing something. And it frustrates me and it gets me angry and I start to think like, well, why can't he just get it together? Why can't he just figure this out? Doesn't he understand how his decisions affect me? How it affects how I feel, his family, our reputation? And I start thinking about me, 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 me. But then when I realize that there's a real battle for the soul of my son, and for his life, rather than battling him, I start battling with him against the enemy. Because I started to realize that my son and his strongholds and his battles, those are, that's a spiritual war. And rather than just go into his room and start telling him, why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? I started to just speak truth into his life. I started to tell him, you know what, Isaac? Do you understand that Satan's purpose is not to entertain you? That Satan's purpose is to destroy you? That whatever he's giving you now, that the end leads to death? That if you continue to do this, it's gonna lead to that, and that's gonna lead to this, and that's gonna lead to that, and in the end, you're either gonna be homeless, dead, or in prison? And I tell him, this is from the enemy. And I speak truth and I still point out the sin. But now I tell him, you know what? Let me battle with you. When you're struggling, when these things are coming into your mind, when they're coming into your life, let dad and I know. We want to pray for you. We want to battle with you. And I can honestly tell you that now we've locked arms together. And now we're on the same side battling the same enemy. But why? Because I understood that my son himself is a victim, that those strongholds and those things that come into his life are from the enemy. So when I understood who the real enemy was, I began again to speak truth into his life, and now we fight together. So I wonder, do you realize when you are irritated and angry, when you're fighting the people in your life, that you're fighting the wrong war? If you don't, you are going to be fighting against the wrong people and you're going to be fighting the, with the wrong weapon and you are going to get exhausted because it will become a never-ending war. Paul knew that since the battle was spiritual, he couldn't use weapons of this world. He knew that the weapons of this world would be ineffective in dealing with the source. What is the source? Who's putting these thoughts in their, in their minds? Who's motivating these people to act the way that they act. What is the source? It's the enemy. How do we fight that? How do we fight that root problem? Well, we cannot waste any more time and effort fighting on the wrong level. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4, he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. They pull down stronghold. They cast down every argument and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. 
And he says that he, it brings it, we bring in all our thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So if we don't fight with weapons of the flesh or carnal weapons, what do we fight with? We fight with something that's much more powerful, and it's the word of God. Do you realize that the word of God is living and alive and powerful? And Paul says to be able to bring down strongholds, to be able to cast down arguments. Paul sent this letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he meant for it to encourage some, to teach some, to correct some, to rebuke some, to expose some. Only the word of God can do that. The same word of God that goes out today. Listen, in a group like this, the same word of God that's going to go out today is going to hit every single one of you guys in a different way. What can do that? The word of God. Some of you need correcting. Some of you need encouraging. Some of you need rebuking. And some of you just clear out need to be exposed. And the word of God can do that because it's, it is powerful and it is living. And the Bible says that it's able to discern your thoughts, your emotions, your motives in a way that nobody else can and no other word can. So only the word of God is mighty enough to do these things. And we see this in the life of Jesus when Jesus came face to face and battled with the devil. If you want to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 11. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1, says this, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on, a pinnac on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone." And Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall, fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil led him left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. And then the book of Luke says this, Luke 4.13 says, Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed him until an opportune time. He, he wasn't done. He'd come back later again. So no matter what arguments are going on, whether they're external or whether they're internal, whether the enemy is someone else or whether we are our own enemy, we fight the same way with the word of God because the reality is, and I don't know about you, but I've come to realize that the person who gives me the most trouble is me. The person who I fight the most with is me in here every day, every minute. From the moment that I wake up, there's a constant battle going on in my life. So I don't know about you, but most of the arguments in my life and most of the battles that I'm fighting in my life are happening in my own head and in my own flesh. Do I eat the donut? Do I not eat the donut? <laughs> you know, I just did a 45-minute cycling class that only killed about half of that donut. And you know, that's a real petty decision, but we're constantly deciding every day who wins the battle. Does my flesh win the battle? Or do, does what I know to be right wins the battle? I'm constantly at war. But sometimes the enemy is someone else 
and the attack is clearly coming from my spiritual enemy and his forces. Listen, no matter what the source is, we fight in the same way with the word of God. We see that Satan attacked Jesus in the same way that he attacks you and I today by tempting us to do something that is outside of God's will and outside of God's plan. If Satan had no respect for the Son of God, I want you to think about that. If Satan had no respect for the Son of God and came to him and tempted him at his weakest point, what makes you think that he's not going to do the same to us? If he said, I'm done with you now, but I'm coming back at an opportune time, do you not understand that Satan is looking for that opportune time in our life? When we're tired, when we're worn, when we're maybe, maybe it might even be when everything's going great. We need to understand that there is a fight going on and that the only way to battle it is the way Jesus did with the word of God. So Satan will and does come into our lives and he argues and tries to convince us to live in ways that are contrary to how God says we should live, to meet our own needs, to take matters into our own hands, he tells us. But Jesus knew how to cast down those arguments. He knew how to cast down everything that Satan promised that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Over and over we read that Jesus responded, it is written, it is written, it is written. So it didn't matter if those things benefited Jesus or not. It didn't matter if it was bread that benefited him. It didn't matter if it was glory that benefited him. It didn't matter what the enemy was promising. Jesus would not allow his own need to cause him to compromise. In the end, the word of God would get the last word. And so I wonder who is getting the last word. The word of God needs to be the highest authority and should always get the last word in our lives and in our battles. He needs, the word of God needs to be the final say so in those arguments that are going on in our heads and in our hearts. Who I am, what I say, what I do, how I respond, they all need to be directed and guided by the word of God. Today, we want to identify ourselves by so many different things. I'm Mexican, I'm female, I'm this, I'm that. But the thing that defines us the most is the word of God. The way I behave, the way I respond, everything about me needs to start and end with the word of God. I cannot allow anything to deviate me to change the course of my life because the Bible says that God has a plan for my life and I need to be in his word figuring it out. What is that? And not allowing anything or anyone to take me away from that plan. So Satan tempts you and I in the same way that he tempted Jesus and in the same way that he has been tempting people since Adam and Eve with the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. Jesus came out victorious because he battled the enemy with the word of God, not his emotions or his needs. Was Jesus hungry? Yes. But he, did, he was not going to compromise to meet his own needs. Was he the son of God? Yes, but he would reveal that to those who had faith in him when he died and rose again. He didn't need Satan to take him on this high pinnacle and let him fall and the angels carry him to reveal who he was. Jesus said, no, my father has a plan on how he's going to reveal that and I don't need to cut corners. Did he have a heart and a desire for the world? Yes, Jesus Christ died for it but he would not worship Satan to get it because ultimately it was gonna be his in eternity. And I wonder, what real need do you have today? What real work does the Lord wanna do in your life today? But are we cutting corners? Are we willing to compromise to get those things? Then those things have become our God. We need to put those high things and put them in their place under the Lord and allow God to do that in his timing. Because otherwise we're going to be like Eve who lost the argument with Satan. Because rather than holding on to the word of God, she was willing to reason with Satan who promised her so much but delivered so little. Do you realize that? That the enemy always promises you a lot. His, his like presentation is amazing but he never delivers on those promises. 
And Eve was willing to reason with him. She was willing to listen to his words. She was willing to elevate Satan's words and his promises above those of God and what God had clearly said because she wanted what Satan had to offer. And she did not consider the consequences. And I wonder how many of you guys today are entertaining the whispers of Satan. How many of you guys are willing to close an eye to sin or willing to step into sin because he's offering you something that you want? Don't be like Eve. You, we need to consider the consequences because when we get things, but we get them outside of God's will, there's always a consequence behind it. And let me tell you, the consequences stick around a lot longer than any pleasure you got out of that sin. So we need to consider the, the consequences of the decisions we're making. We need to not be listening to the voice of Satan and definitely not elevating those things to the level of Bible, to the level of God's word. So I, again, I wonder today, who gets the final word in your life? Does the word of God cast down and win the arguments and the positions in your life that are contrary to God? Who sits in the high places of your heart? Who or what have you exalted to the throne of ultimate authority in your life? And who gets the last word in, in your life? Do you understand that we are in a spiritual war and that the only way we can win is to fight back with spiritual weapons, which is the word of God and prayer? That's how we fight back. So if you have elevated anything or anyone in the position that only God should hold, I pray that today you would decide to cast those things down. Whether they be your dreams, whether they be your lusts, whether it's your sin, your habits, your character, your heritage, it doesn't matter what it is. Well, I'm Mexican and this is the way that we act. Well, I'm this or where I'm that. You know what? It doesn't matter what it is. Whatever it is that's making you behave contrary, I don't care if it's your dreams as it, as, since you were a child. If it's contrary to what the Lord has in your life and what he's asking you to do, then we need to cast those things down. Because you've given those things a place, a high place, a throne an authority that does not belong to it. That place belongs only to God. Listen, your feelings are not Bible. They're not Bible. I don't know about you, but my feelings can change. The Bible has been around. God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. My feelings change if I just drink coffee. <laughs> Like, honestly, before I'm going to teach anywhere, I never drink coffee. Because I know how much just sugar or caffeine can influence my feelings. My feelings are not Bible. My hopes, my dreams, as good as they are, my hopes, my dreams for my husband, for my family, for myself, as good as those things are, they're not gospel. They're not gospel. And sometimes the Lord has a better plan in fact, the Bible says that God is able to do far beyond what you and I can even imagine. So my dreams, my hopes, they're not gospel. They're not on the same level of God's plan and God's will in my life. My opinions are not inspired. Although, you, you know, some of us are willing to argue our opinions and we're willing to like really, you know, dig our heels on it. Listen, your opinions, my opinions, they're not inspired. The word of God is inspired. The Holy Spirit inspired these people to write these things. These are the very words of God. Only the Bible contains the words of the living God and his words are alive and living and again, sharper than any two-edged sword. So we need to trust God and trust his word. He knows you better than you know yourself and he knows the desires of your heart. And he knows when and how to meet those needs and those desires. Listen to this. I really want you guys to get this. He will never give you something that will hurt you, but he's never going to keep something from you that is good. So the next time the enemy comes and says, well, why wouldn't God want you to have that? When he starts putting that argument in your heart and in your mind, 
You have to say, if God doesn't allow me to have it right now, it's because it's not good for me right now. If God wanted me to have it, I'd have it. And when God thinks I'm ready for it, I will have it. So know that the Lord knows you. He knows the desires of your heart. And he's going to give you the things that are good, but he'll never give you anything to hurt you. So I want you today to let go of any part of your life today that opposes what you know to be true in God. And I want you to hold fast to his better plan. Remember that the day will come when you and I will come face to face with Jesus. Just like the day came when those people had to face Paul. Paul did eventually go to Corinth. And there was an accountability I eventually do get home, and my kids do have to give me accountability. Those dishes better be washed. (laughs) But listen, the day will come when you and I will stand face to face with Jesus Christ. Whether that comes because the Lord comes back, or whether you and I die, go home to be with the Lord, we are all going to stand face to face with the Lord, and there will be an accountability. The Bible says that some of us will enter into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And I hope that you will not be foolish like those who said that Paul, he writes boldly, but he does nothing. Listen, the only reason that the Lord hasn't come back is because the Bible says that he's graceful, not willing that none should perish. And I hope that you're not foolish enough to say, you know what, the Bible talks a good talk, but you know what, I don't see any consequence in my life. Don't wait until the day of reckoning. Don't wait until you are standing face to face with the Lord. God is merciful. God is not willing that any should perish, but he has sounded the warning and one day he will return. So I pray that today you will be people who hear the word, who change the things that need to be changed, and who anxiously await the day that we stand face to face with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen.